Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to an evening of stand-up comedy here at the Grand Theatre Leeds. Would you now please kindly put your hands together for me, Ben Elton. Thank you. respond uh, with such warmth to that astonishingly self-indulgent request, request for uh, applause before I've done anything at all. I always think it's the strangest business to be in a job where you can do that, you get their applause before anything, so I'm going to do my best to justify it as the evening progresses. Let's start with establishing the parameters for the evening. I must do this because there's been some misunderstandings and I hate to think of an audience going away feeling short-changed, disappointed in any way. Because this tour's been going on four months and here we are in election year. Oh yes! <laughs> And a lot of people asking the same question. Are you going to do all the politics, Ben? Are you going to stick all that principle, all those uh, concerns? Are you going to shove all that into the act? Well, I'm not going to bother. The politicians don't anymore. Why should I? <laughs> it's all style and no content these days, isn't it? What a shame. Sound bite culture we've arrived at. We've got new Labour. What is it? I've been in a party 20 years, I haven't got the faintest idea. <laughs> I watched Mr Blair at last summer's conference season, he tried to make it clear. He said, New Labour is about New Britain. It's about a better Britain. It's about a brighter Britain. It's about a more britain he sort of Britain. Yeah, but what is he doing, <laughs> Tony? They could get Danny Baker to do the party political <laughs> broadcast. He needs a job, he could revive his Daz style, couldn't he? <laughs> Are you telling me, Danny, I can have a better and a brighter Britain and at no extra cost? <laughs> I think I'm going to have a little bit of that myself, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to go easy on myself, yes. Yeah? So I'm going to be a bit less controversial. I'm going to be less irritating. I'm going to wind up a few less people. This is going to be New Ben. Yes. <laughs> There will be no knob gags on the new bay. No, 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 because the British knob is the best in the world. <laughs> and it's had the piss taken out of it for too long. <laughs> I pledge to you all here tonight that I shall put the great back into great, big, throbbing, blue-veined stonker. <laughs> You see, ladies and gentlemen, it's all style, no content. This is shaping up to be the most boring, uninspiring election in history. There's no issues. They're all chasing the centre ground. Law and order. Patriotism. Everyone's cloaking themselves in the flag. Labour got more Union Jacks up than the Tories. They all said the same thing. They're going to put the great back into Britain. They've all said it. Why can't we be proud of what we are, eh? Why can't we accept what we are today, be proud and happy with that, play to our strengths and not get involved in stuff we just can't do? We never should have gone to the Olympics. <laughs> we just shouldn't have gone. It was asking for it, wasn't it? Our poor old team. We put them through it, didn't they? Got off the plane. Well, you're going to take the piss out of us now or wait five seconds, eh? <laughs> Outrageous. Nobody wanted us there. All the other, other teams were complaining to the International Committee. You haven't invited the British, have you? <laughs> They're shit! <laughs> we don't want to play them. Us turning up at the Olympics would be like a man with no knob turning up at an orgy. <laughs> we're supposed to be ashamed, ladies and gentlemen. We're supposed to be ashamed. We only got one gold medal. Shamed in front of the world. We got one gold medal. We're a nation of 60 million people. We're one of the G7 economic superpowers. We got one gold. And that was in rowing. <laughs> As if anyone gives a flying fuck in a high wind. <laughs> I mean, it's a little bit tough to have a street party on the strength of that one, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm not ashamed at all. I don't care. I feel sorry for the individual sportsmen and women involved, of course, but beyond that, I don't give a toss, because as far as I'm concerned, the Olympics, as with all international and national sporting events, has been perverted. The sporting ideal is no more about community and playing together and everyone. Now, it's all money. It's all sponsorship. So nobody cares about anything but winners, career earnings, sponsorship deals. Never mind about losers. There's no money in losers. That's not what sport's about. Sport's not about some kind of physical elitism. It's about everyone getting involved. I mean, if you were having a game of cricket in a park and there was someone in the bat who was a bit crap, you'd give them a go, wouldn't you? Give them an easy one, bowl underarm, wouldn't you? Give them one like that. 
Well, I reckon that's what the Australians and the West Indians ought to do for us next time. <laughs> of course they should. That would be sporty. They come over here, they say, all right, look, come on, lads, give him a chance. He's only British. All right, mate, now look, have a, have a go with that then. Oh, dear. Look, I'll tell you what we'll do. We won't count that. You're still in. All right, here we go. <laughs> I'll tell you what I'll do, mate. Look, I'll, I'll put my jumper halfway. You've only got to run <laughs> as far as that. The other night, somebody shouted out, yeah, what about New Zealand? What about the Kiwis? Yeah, of course, we won, didn't we? We won a game in New Zealand, yes, yeah, sporting renaissance. <laughs> I think we should remind ourselves before we hang out too much bunting that there are more people in Birmingham than there are in New Zealand. <laughs> you know, the dice are slightly loaded in our favour in this case. But the point is, if we are going to get involved in these international sporting events, we've got to use our head. You see, we're obviously crap at all the games. What we've got to do is invent some new ones. Traditionally, we always invent the games, and then while the year or two it takes everyone else to learn the rules, we can win a few seasons, you see. <laughs> we've got to invent some new games. The, the Americans, they're always shoving in a new sport all the time, aren't they? In the Olympics last time, what was it? Beach volleyball. That's what the Americans had. Beach volleyball. Olympic beach volleyball. What's coming next, eh? Sand castle building. <laughs> Bury dad without waking him up. Here's a good one. Try and get your trunks on without anyone seeing your knob. <laughs> that would be a good spectator sport, wouldn't it? All the big Russians, bell end show. <laughs> it's under the lip of his towel there. That'll cost him points. They never should have used such a well-hung athlete. That was a mistake. <laughs> Bit of arsehole cleavage from the Germans. That'll cost them points. We'd win that, wouldn't we, eh? The British. No one sees our bits on the beach. <laughs> Let's get involved in some sports we can do. Something we train for. Drinking games, that's what we do. That's what we're selling. We should have gone to Atlanta. We should have said, all right, they're all running the 100 metres sprint. Who cares? We should have said, calm down, I'm not impressed. So you can run fast. So what? There's no bus, what's the point? <laughs> right, you stood still, good, relaxed, here we go then. Let's see you light one of your farts, come on. <laughs> You can borrow my lighter, see if you can send a sheet of blue flame across a crowded snug. Go on, have a go. See if you can catch one in a jar, keep it half an hour, then surprise your girlfriend with it. <laughs> it's not easy. It takes as much physical dexterity and skill as, as running fast or jumping high. I mean, why is it that certain physical attributes are deemed laudable and others aren't. Why is it that you can jump high? That means great, wonderful, much to be applauded. But if you can burp a Kylie Minogue medley, it's just rude. <laughs> I don't know, which I consider more entertaining, frankly. <laughs> I mean, come on, the high jump. Does any, I mean, what, has anyone thought about these sports in the 2,000 years since the Greeks invented them? I mean, what, high jump, so what? Marvellous athlete, jumps in the air, tremendous. Trains every day, since the age of five, goes into a field every day and jumps in the air. Marvellous, jumps and he's down again and then a few minutes rest and another jump, marvellous. Well done, that man. Who cares, the world's moved on, we got lifts, we've got ladders. I want to say to the silly bugger, get on a chair, mate, mate. You, know, you can do it, pissed. Who decides these things? What's good? What's bad? What's groovy? What's uncool? I mean, it is strange how sports have actually got fashion attached to them. You know, some sports are fashionable and some aren't. I mean, like football has become so fashionable, hasn't it? Everybody, all the stars trying to hang out with footballers. It gives them that kind of blokey credibility. You know what I mean? It's all that football thing. You know, it's like... Uh, I'm not saying that football hasn't always been popular. Of course it's been popular. It's the most popular game of all. But let's not mistake popularity with fashionableness. I mean, you know, Noel Edmonds knows a story or two about that. <laughs> the truth is that out of the blue, out of the blue, football's become groovy. You've got all your comics and all your alternatives and all your musicians falling over each other, going about how much they like their football, because it implies a kind of instant ironic wit, an instant blokiness. He's all right, he likes his football. No, I'm saying he's all right. You know, even the girls, the girls like football. Yeah, where does this basketball? Yeah, we like our football. Everybody likes their football. What's this about? I mean, football's always been around. Don't get me wrong. I'm not knocking it. It's great. I mean, actually, football serves an extremely important socio-anthropological function. Football was invented 
because blokes have got nothing to say to their mates. <laughs> Without football, nothing. Football was invented to fill in the gaps between pints, but suddenly, <laughs> out of blue, it's become groovy and fashionable. You can instantly sound kind of witty if you mention it. How does that happen? Why is it that one physical recreation is, is, is farty and nerdy and turdy and gets worth, and another is good old blokey bloke bloke? What is that about? Why is it that the lad who uh, wraps a blanket round his neck, who know, calls him, pretends it's a cloak, calls himself Gandalf, War wizard of the troll hobbits <laughs> and plays Dungeons and Dragons of a weekend. How come he's a total farty, turdy, nerdy gitsworth? And the bloke next door who spends 40 quid on a nylon shirt with the name of a Korean typewriter firm on the front <laughs> is a bloody good blokey bloke. He's all right, he likes his football. What is that about? It's about style, ladies and gentlemen. It's about fashion. Fashion sounds a bit like fascism, and I think they're similar because we are intimidated. We are dictated to. We are the victims of style. We live and are drowning under a tidal wave of style bullshit. You don't buy newspapers anymore. You buy style papers. They've got a couple of pages of news at the front. The rest of it's style and media and people and buzz and vibe. You, you, you get your Sunday papers, there's that many style sections. You can't lift the bastard up in the news, <laughs> you? you? buy your Sunday shite, you've got to wade through your culture section, your vibe, your buzz, your people, your style, your gig, your groove, your wank, your pretentious bollocks. <laughs> in a pretentious bollock section at a Sunday shite to find out how uncool we are this week. <laughs> well, I say thus far and no further. I'm standing up and being counted uncool and proud of it. Because there's nothing wrong with being uncool. It's the people trying to be cool who cause all the trouble. People carry knives, they're trying to look cool. People bully people, they're trying to look cool. Uncool people never hurt anyone. All they do is stand around staring at trains. <laughs> Saying, let's start celebrating uncool. This starts tonight. This tour is a celebration. I'm doing this gig tonight for the people who wear the anoraks. <laughs> yes, I am. They wear them because it's cold outside and it rains. <laughs> That's why they wear them, not to piss off the editor of Loaded magazine. No. <laughs> I'm here for the people who wear the shell suits. Yes, I am. <laughs> they wear them because they're cheap and you can put the whole family in them. <laughs> the same design. It looks a load of shit, but you can find each other in Toys R Us on a Saturday <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> Style has become synonymous with aggression. That's what I find so disheartening. We're living in an age where if you want to look cool, you've got to sneer. You can't afford to be an enthusiast. You're an enthusiast, you're wanker, you know? Everything is about sneering, style, you know, like what a wanker. A loaded magazine, bunch of arse, wanker of the week, girly show, girly show, oh dear. <laughs> this is style, you know, nice tits and everyone's a wanker. This is new feminism, blimey. I'm amazed Mrs Pankhurst never worked it out 90 years ago. She could have stood outside Buckingham Palace with a tits out going, what a lot of wankers, eh? Wanker. <laughs> Dear, oh dear, I mean, I can remember the time when you wanted to be stylish, you loved people, you know? It was the 60s, Every, you were a wanker, I love you, man, that's great, you know, <laughs> I love you. It's like, but now you want to be stylish, you've got to sneer, you've got to be aggressive. The SAS, out of the blue, the SAS had become a fashion icon. Never could have predicted it, but five years ago, it all started. A publishing revolution. The SAS have become a publisher's dream. There's been like 30 books. They've all been top 10. They've saved some of the small publishers. I mean, it's the only thing the SAS have actually saved in quite a long time. <laughs> Incredible load of books. They've sold loads. But what are you actually saying about yourself when you're reading these books, you know? Sat on a bus reading Bravo 20 or The One That Got Away. You might as well have, yes, I am a bit sad, written on your forehead. <laughs> Divides the audience a little. <laughs> There's always a fair number of lads going steady on, been fucking hell. <laughs> you know, respect, man, you know, I respect, you know, for the best. The elite, you know, like Bravo 2 1 Commander Para, yeah, the elite, yeah. <laughs> you know, the best, respect, you know. Because, bra you know, Bravo 2 0, it's not, it's not wank, no, no, it's a proper history book, yeah, it's history, yeah. <laughs> it's history, that is, yeah, for the best. Best? 
best at what? Self-publicity, yes, granted, but I thought the whole point was they were supposed to remain discreet. <laughs> it's not very difficult for a foreign power to come across them when they're signing books at Waterstones, is it? <laughs> best, best at what? The entire Bravo 2-0 cult is based on a fiasco, a completely failed mission in the Gulf War. The SAS, in a desert, in Iraq, looking for the Iraqis, couldn't find them. This is Britain's best, I remind you. They couldn't find an Iraqi in Iraq. <laughs> yeah, we could have helped them with that, couldn't we? Even we? We've not been trained, but we could have worked it out. No, wrong place. Go to Baghdad, where they live. <laughs> No water. Iraqi, not stupid. <laughs> but they're all wandering around the desert going, anyone seen them? No, I've not seen them. <laughs> you seen them, Sarge? No, not me either. And we're the best. Imagine if they'd sent the crap. <laughs> <laughs> What's he saying he orders? Uh, Iraqis. Towel on the head, a little bit excitable. Anyone seen them? No. <laughs> they're always getting lost. Yes, they yes, they got lost in Iraq, they got lost in Borneo, Horn of Africa, they're always getting lost, never know where they're going, what's that about? They've been trained, what's the problem? I'll tell you what it is, why they can't find out where they're going? They've all got those black bars in front of their eyes, haven't they? <laughs> no wonder they can't see where they're going, silly buggers, lift the bar up. Oh, <laughs> I was in a shop. <laughs> In Smith's the other day, having a look, you know, at the SAS books, you know, just getting material, and also because it's pretty exciting stuff, actually. And, <laughs> and I just had to laugh. You know, you don't often laugh out loud in public. You know, if you see something funny, you go, hmm, yes, that's quite amusing, yes. <laughs> I'll tell someone about that in a pub later, you know, but just occasionally, you actually do laugh. And I was, I couldn't believe it, because the big one they were flogging in, in Smith's, right, this was actually just before Christmas, was the SAS Survival Guide. This was the big book. They had dumpings, loads of them and it wasn't even like a book what it was was it was a folder a ring pull clip folder and what you did was you opened it up and you opened the clips and you took out the page that was relevant to your survival situation and then you survived it and then you put it back in and clipped it up again closed it up. that's probably exactly like it isn't a real SAS isn't it yeah. and I was having a look at this and the poster right big bloke with a machine gun and a bar across his eyes and he says uh, it says essential survival information from Britain's best essential survival tactics for the elite of the elite. Essential. I thought, well, I better have a look. Blimey. Can't think how I got through life so far. Better have a, better have a quick flick in case I get garroted on the way past Boots, you know. <laughs> so I opened it right. First page I saw, no word of a lie. Edible grasses, lichens and mosses of the British Isles. <laughs> now, how pissed would you have to be? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I mean, we've all rolled out the boozer in our time and eaten some shite, haven't we? <laughs> but you've never actually gone as far as, come on, lads, let's go and scrape a bit of lichen off a rock. <laughs> bit of chilli sauce, pit of bread, lovely. <laughs> if they wanted to give us some essential survival information, they could tell us where we can find an edible Kentucky Fried Chicken. <laughs> that would be nice. I don't know what it's about, this aggression, and particularly for blokes, this kind of chippy blokiness that's going on. You know, this aggressive thing. I think the reason is that men are really going through an identity crisis. This has been well documented by psychologists. Men are feeling beleaguered and, and on the back foot. They don't know who they are anymore. Well, let's face it, the jobs whereby a, a man defined his, 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 his worth to himself and his family and his community, those heavy industrial jobs, they've gone. Uh, the girls are ahead at school, you know, the future is increasingly more cerebral and the girls seem to be better at it, they're ahead at school and university. The future's looking female. Blokes are feeling beleaguered and there's a physical problem too besetting us to go with all that. It's down there in the gonads, it's sperm. You know this, I'm sure. Sperm counts are down. I'm sure you've been reading about it. But not just a little down, we're talking catastrophically down, like 25% drop since before the war. Now, now that, that's big. They don't know whether it's to do with the additives in the food or pollution, but for whatever reason, every man in this room is packing a considerably runnier mix downstairs <laughs> than Grandad did. Now, you all thought Grandad was a bit of a silly old fucker, didn't you? <laughs> Stupid git sat in a corner of the room dribbling and always wanting to watch a different channel than the rest of the family. <laughs> Him and his mates in a photo album. What a lot of wankers before the war. Flat caps, uninteresting game of football they used to play. 
But let me tell you now, they had flipping big bollocks. <laughs> That's why they used to wear those big shorts, you see. <laughs> fit their bollocks in. That's what that was about. That's why the game was so slow. It was as much as they could do to drag their bollocks up and down the pitch. Oh, Dixie Dean's making a tremendous brave dash down the court line, dragging his colossal scrotum along the hallowed turf of Wembley. You know, if you go to a, if you go to a museum, Everyone always has the same kind of reaction when they go to a museum. They, they, if they see a suit of armour, they say, oh, isn't he short? Wasn't medieval man short? Look at that, four foot eleven, five foot. Wasn't medieval man short? He wasn't short. He was bow-legged. <laughs> <laughs> and the problem is, of course, no, you've got to be, uh, be aware that the NHS is actually under great deal of pressure because of this sperm crisis, because uh, hard-pressed as it is, there's even more people going to the fertility clinics wanting to check out the mix, make sure things aren't too soupy in the wife fronts. And a lot more men would be applying for sperm tests if they had the guts, because a recent article said that GPs are saying a lot of men are nervous about this, wondering about their fertility, etc. They're embarrassed. They don't want to have the sperm test. So here I am to perform a social service, because don't be nervous. It is an easy thing. You know, I can help. I mean, I, was, I don't mean I, I don't mean I can help directly. What I'm saying is that it's an easy, it's no problem. I have had a sperm test and it is a simple, you just go and do it. But a lot of blokes think it's like that, the way it used to be, very sleazy, you know, because in the old days you have to produce the sample at the clinic. So there'd like be a group of guys waiting and one by one you go in a room and they give you a little dirty mag. It's a horrible type of do. But these days they let you produce your sample at home, which is of course much, you know, much more relaxing. They'll lend you the mag, lads. Don't worry about that. <laughs> oh, yeah, you can take the dirty mag. You won't be able to get it open, but you can have it. <laughs> but they let you produce your sample at home because sperm apparently survives an hour once outside the body. So as long as you can get back to the clinic with the sample within an hour, they'll let you produce it at home, which is nice. You know, it's more relaxing, it's more civilised. And there's an upside, gentlemen. Well, the first time in your entire life, you get to have a legitimate wank. <laughs> oh, yes, no, sneaking off to the toilet for you that morning. In the sitting room. <laughs> on the sofa in front of the fire. <laughs> Loud and proud. <laughs> right, love, I'm going to have a wank. <laughs> I don't care if your mother is coming round. <laughs> this is a medical necessity. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> anyway, so you obviously have to go to the clinic to get the, the receptacle, a little sterilised plastic pot, you know, they've got to give you that. You can't, you can't just take it along in a teacup, you know. Like, you can't just take your sheets along. <laughs> Please, Ben, you're 37, get away. Anyway. So you go to the doctor, and it's funny, he seemed quite embarrassed. I don't know why. He was saying, you understand, Mr. Elton, the process, you know, what is required, where, whereby you produce your sample, you understand what is necessary. I suggest, doctor, I think I can just about recall, you know. <laughs> I may be a little rusty. It could be as much as three or even four hours since I <laughs> visited Mrs. Hand and her five lovely daughters, but nonetheless, <laughs> you know, I think it'll come flooding back. So, <laughs> so he gives you the pot, right? There you go, I'm, this is all true. I'm, this is to help. This is a social service I'm performing now. Because <laughs> it'd be lads singing, all right, yeah, take this down, love, take this down. So anyway, you, you take the pot home, and in your own time, you know, in your own space, one off the wrist, as one does, you know, <laughs> into the pot. Which, which, incidentally, is not bleeding easy. <laughs> it's a tiny little pot they give you. There's no funnel, nothing like that, no. I mean, the ejaculation is not an exact science, in my experience. <laughs> give you. It's outrageous. Anyway, finally, you know, you get it, you know, you, as you can, best you can, into the pot. You know, put the top on the pot. If you can fit a fucking top on the pot! <laughs> I said to him, what's that, Dr. Bloody hell, I need more capacity than that. Here, I'll take your dustbin. Here we go. <laughs> Two minutes later, I was back. There you go, Doctor, test those. You'll have to wrestle the bastards first. Eh? <laughs> Dolphins coming out of that dick. Where I come from, a pot is adequate. So anyway, you put, <laughs> you put your top on the pot. 
to core it down. And then you've got to get back to the clinic within an hour, right? And uh, that means that you obviously got to rush, but you've got to keep it warm because the sperm will die if not kept at bodily temperature. So what you do, doctor says, absolutely true, get the pot, stick it down your pants. That's what he says, get the, stick it down your pants, work it, if possible, into a warm and sweaty crevice. <laughs> if you can, shove it up your ass. <laughs> It's true, that's exactly what they say. You get it? Uh, not all the way up, obviously, just, you know, <laughs> clamp it gently and get back, to the, get back to the clinic within an hour. So, I'm off out into the streets, as you will. <laughs> this is true, I'm saying. I'm walking along thinking, I hope I don't get knocked down now. <laughs> you just feel exposed, you know? I mean, it's nothing, it's funny, because there's nothing illegal or anything about being found with a pot of spunk in your pants. It's, it just doesn't look good, does it? You don't want to have the conversation, you know what I'm saying? But the problem is you've got to rush, so you've got to be careful, but you've got to rush. Oh, no, I've only got an hour, 48 minutes, 47 minutes, taxi, taxi. Excuse me, mate, can I take this one? I've got some spunk up my ass and it's dying. <laughs> So, so anyway, you get to the clinic, you hand it in, and this is where the trouble starts, gentlemen. This is why I'm doing this routine. It's a social service, because you will feel beleaguered and exposed and emasculated. Because they don't go up past you instantly. They don't go, oh, yes, that looks absolutely marvellous. Well, well done. No, no. They say, thanks a lot. We'll be in touch. And then you got to wait. Then you've got to wait, right? Well, some stranger is testing your sperm. And suddenly, you who thought you were a relatively relaxed, fairly to get a sort of individual, are desperately, oh my God, am I a man? Have I, oh, I'm being tested, my manhood. What if I fail? I, I wish I cheated. Use someone else's dick, you know? Like, <laughs> genuinely, you feel exposed, and, and, and then the letter comes. Now, I'm telling you, gentlemen, this is going to happen to you, so take it easy, be ready, because, like, it's unpleasant. Now, it's very impersonal. It's a printed form. So many people have sperm tests. They don't send you a nice letter. Now, it's a printed form. Dot, dot, dot. They fill in your figures. That's all. Top of the letter, it says, Results, Mr. Elton's spunk test. <laughs> now, listen, it's not going to be any nicer for you. You be sitting down, have a cup of tea ready, because there's no counselling. There's no preamble. They're straight in, in with a solar plexus. First line, 33%... Sluggish. <laughs> Sluggish, what a word to use about a man's dollop. I mean, couldn't they have been kinder? Couldn't they have said relaxed or something like that? No, sluggish, not giving it a sufficient wriggle. No, not in good. Next line, no better, worse. I'm on the floor now, I've fainted. They're fanning me to get me round. 41% swimming in the wrong direction. <laughs> Stupid spunk! <laughs> this stuff is backing away up me dick in fear! <laughs> then I think, hang on a minute, this isn't fair, this test is rigged! How are they supposed to know what's the right direction, poor little bastards? They're in a plastic pot! <laughs> all wriggling around, I don't know, anyone seen an egg? I, I don't know where. <laughs> supposed to go. They're wriggling hither and thither. They're like the SAS in Iran. <laughs> Mind you, <laughs> I suspect there's quite a few women in the audience thinking they don't need the services of the National Health Service <laughs> to point out that spunk sometimes swims in the wrong direction. <laughs> no, 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 no. Any woman who's ever been foolish enough to have that quick last-minute shag prior to going out to a post-dinner party. <laughs> Got yourself all ready, new frock and all that, and suddenly he's desperate. Oh, come on, darling, come on. I'll be too pissed when we get home. Come on, come on. <laughs> She's, oh, go on and quit, but don't mess up my hair. Go on, here we are. <laughs> Which is all very well, except till you get to the dinner party. Everything's going nicely. You sat down, have any hors d'oeuvres, and you cough. <laughs> One ball evening, pleasant. You don't want to move in case your fanny farts. It's no good. You've been nibbling on a bit of toast and pate, two crumbs at the back of your neck. <laughs> Bang! Three and a half million sperms, it, but you gusset. You look down, you're sitting on an embroidered chair. You think if this soaks through, I'm going to have to kill myself. You actually got to sit there all night till it dries three in the morning, everyone's gone. You're going, I'd like another cup of coffee if I could. <laughs> I 
I'll tell you what, I've never heard a better argument for safe sex. You know, all the posters the government have for, say, trying to get people to use condoms, that's what they should say, girls. If you don't want it all back in your niggas half an hour later, <laughs> tell the bastard to bag it up and take it away with him. <laughs> I must say, it's ruder than I thought. <laughs> I only came along because I quite like Constable Goody in the thin blue <laughs> line. <laughs> anyway, where was it? I was reading this letter, right? And, and it's like, already I'm devastated, but it gets worse. By the last line, it's saying 80% overall inadequate. 80% no use. I'm devastated. I mean, how would you feel? It's like a sudden blow. I'm not a man. I, I failed my, my sperm test. Can, can I take it again? Is, <laughs> is it like your driving test, you know? <laughs> Have as many goes as you like. Yeah, I failed four times, but actually my doctors were real bastards because I had great sperm from the start, I really did. <laughs> no, I failed. Except I haven't failed. Because at the bottom of the letter it says passed. Fine. Not bad, not good, bog standard, dollop of spunk, fair enough, you've passed. <laughs> and I learnt that day something that all men, I think, should take on board, and that is that most spunk is no good. Honestly, there's very little of any use in every drop. There's only a couple of decent wrigglers in an entire wristful. <laughs> it's true. They, and this is true. The rest of them, they're all rubbish. They're sluggish. They're stupid. They're in the wrong direction. They <laughs> don't know where they're going. They've got no idea what's going on. They're like a pub full of blokes, really. <laughs> but what... <laughs> what really kind of... I suppose, in a way, really made me think about the whole experience, because it's a true story, was how exposed I felt about the possibility that I might not live up to some spurious norm of what is required for sexuality. You know, we're all so vulnerable. Naturally, we've always, as a, as a we laugh at sex. It's funny, it's fun, but it's funny. No one's that good, for God's sake. I saw this wonderful documentary. It was really kind of, you know, life enhancing. It was these, these women, they were having an Ann Summers sort of party. You know Ann Summers, the sex shops? They, you don't have to go to the shop sometimes. They have kind of girls parties at home, like a Tupperware party, except it's like a gusset wear party, you know? <laughs> and all the girls sat around having a cup of tea, laughing at the dildos. And it was funny because that's all they were doing. They were pissing themselves. Oh, look at that. There's a whopper. I've never seen one like that. Blimey. Oh, look at that cock ring. That'd rattle around on my old man. Ha! <laughs> Well, I'm not saying the standard of comedy was high. I'm just saying... <laughs> I'm just saying they were having a laugh, and that was marvellous. It wasn't serious, it was a joke. Oh, I'll buy that for Cindy for her 21st. She can unwrap that in the curry house. Ha, 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 you know. Because nobody uses those sex aids. They're just a joke. People buy them for presents. No one actually uses the things. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> Again, I fear I've failed to leap the cultural divide here. <laughs> Long, cold nights up in Leeds, clearly. <laughs> yes, I can see a few very doubtful women down there sat there <laughs> thinking, well, I must say, he's got that wrong, hasn't he? <laughs> Speak for yourself, Mr Elton. I've got my oriental love balls up me twat as you speak! <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised, girls. You probably thought, well, he might be a bit boring. He's been off the telly for a few years. I'll shove the love balls up. <laughs> if he gets dull, I'll give him a clank, have an orgasm. <laughs> Blokes out next to you, I wonder what that clanking What have you? Have you got the love balls up? Yes, I've got them up. Lovely. I'd love a go at them love balls. I would love a go. I'm fascinated. I'll tell you what, if I had a fanny, that would be the first thing I'd do. <laughs> first thing, double portion, straight up. Well, life would be beautiful. Nothing would matter. Every little stroll would be a dream. <laughs> Every shudder of the underground train would rattle up and down on the buses. Marvellous. You, any little drop, who cares? I'll take the rubbish out, darling. I like a stroll. Whoa, yeah. <laughs> Waiting for a bus? Who cares? Everyone else, the fucking bus is late. You'll be going, yes! <laughs> Is la ha 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 Hey! <laughs> Turn it to total strangers. How was the bus being late for you then, darling? <laughs> I'll tell you what, if you haven't got them up, girls, what about running for a bus? You'd never make it, would you? Oh, bloody Jesus! <laughs> running around. You'd be over prostrate. Everyone else would be on a bus going to work. You'd be lying there in the gutter having a fag. <laughs> Now, there might be one or two of you thinking, 
Hang on, this is a bit off the point. I thought we were talking about style over content and all that, but actually it's not off the point. It's a classic example. Because, you see, uh, Anne Summers, they don't call their sex aids sex aids. They, like all reputable sex shops, call them marital aids. Again, you see, we cover up what we know because we have a conspiracy in this country to accept that sex only happens within the family, heterosexual marriages. You know, the government has even, even legislated on this issue. They've said we can have sex education in schools, but it must be taught within the context of a family married environment. Now, this is outrageous. This is disgusting. We're inheriting this American habit of scoring cheap political capital out of people's lifestyle circumstances. You see slimy bastard politicians at conference using single mothers or, or homosexuals as scapegoats for the ills of society. It's disgusting. And here, when I got married, I was, I was told I'd made a political act. Journos were saying, oh, getting married, Ben. Very conservative thing to do. Not all you expect from Bullshy Ben at all. Have you mellowed, Ben? Have you mellowed? Very conservative, getting married. Getting married, very conservative. I thought, well, yeah, I suppose they're right, really, when you think about it. Because, like, you know, I'm married now. All I've got to do is get myself a secretary and start fucking her on the side, <laughs> and I'll be eligible to join the cabinet, won't I? <laughs> <laughs> But marriage has become a political football. It has, you know. It's an American thing, but we've got it now. People are talking about marriage as if it's something politicians have got a duty to protect or uphold or whatever. All the polis are doing it, you know, and they're worried because not enough people are getting married. You know, I, the reason people are getting married is it's such a hassle, you know. And let me tell you, if you want to know exactly what it feels like to get married, there's a very easy way to recreate the whole feeling. What you do... You want to feel like preparing for a wedding, exactly how it feels, every morning for two months, go to your bank, open all the windows, and shovel money out of the windows. <laughs> That's exactly how it feels to prepare for a wedding, because no one has any concept of how much a wedding is going to cost until they get involved. It doesn't matter whether your budget is large or small, whatever it is, you will exceed it tenfold. <laughs> Marriages cost more than you think. Flowers, for instance. Now, everyone knows flowers are expensive. Always have that experience once every year. Valentine's Day, 15 fucking quid. Bollocks, I'll send you a card. <laughs> but when you get married, you've got to have flowers, and you've no idea what flowers you've got to get. For one thing, uh, marriage flowers aren't called flowers, no. They're called blooms. <laughs> and blooms are exactly the same as flowers, except they cost ten times as much. <laughs> you don't go to the florist, you go to the bloomist. She says, oh, hello, my lovers, you lovely couple, you beautiful, my darlings. What's your bloom budget? What were you hoping to spend on blooms? So you tell her. She laughs! She says, oh, I thought you were in love, dear, oh, dear. You're not taking it seriously. You've no concept. The flowers you've got to buy. I mean, you know you've got to stump up for a bridal arch and a posy for the cute little bridesmaid who'll throw up on it halfway through the ceremony. <laughs> but no, there's flowers you never dreamt existed. Centrepieces. She says, the blue mist, she says, what are you having on the tables, my darlings? What will you have on your tables? <laughs> I said, well, booze. <laughs> Food, you know, towards the end of the evening, possibly a few heads in puddles of vomit, you know. <laughs> no, you've got to have centrepieces, floral pieces, 70 quid ago, you could regrout the bathroom. <laughs> and at the end of the evening, a bunch of old grannies walk off with them under their arm. <laughs> All the say, come back with my life, you old cow. <laughs> You're not even from my side of the family. <laughs> Yeah, like, they should look fucking beautiful. Any idea what they cost? <laughs> Stop sniffing them, you're wearing them out. All right. Bugger <laughs> off. We need to change the traditions. They're not relevant to the modern situation. For instance, the bridal night. Still treated with so much significance. Now, there was a time, of course, when a bridal night was the most significant moment of a young couple's life. My God, they'd never had a hand on each other. Till that very moment, they couldn't wait. They're rushing the service. Yes, I do, for fuck's sake, get on with it! <laughs> we said all this in the rehearsal yesterday. Do we really need to go through it again? <laughs> They're rushing off to, the, off to the reception. No, all right, one course, no pudding, no coffee, no speeches. Come on, darling, we're off. <laughs> you know, these days, a couple get married. They, they've been living together for five years. They probably stopped shagging two years ago. <laughs> They only got married because it was that old break-up and they thought they'd give it a go, you know? <laughs> and, of course, it's their part. 
party. They're not going to bugger off at 10.30 in a shower of confetti. They're going to have a night of it. But the problem is, another tradition says, no one's allowed to leave till the bride's gone. So it's like five in the morning, you know? The, the grannies are beginning to die around, <laughs> around the edges of the room. There's pacemakers giving out, you know? <laughs> thinking about keeping a vigor on for a couple of funerals the next day. <laughs> Finally, they get back to the bridal suite, you know? The bride and groom, they book the bridal suite, the local hotel. You know it's a bridal suite because there's a doily on the toilet roll, you know? That's, <laughs> that's how you know. <laughs> They get back, they're pissed as assholes. They can't, they're staggering, they can't find the light switch. They're in the dark, <laughs> tripping over the toilet, looking for the bed, they can't. She drops the bombshell. Out of the blue, she says it. Come on then, you've got to shag me. <laughs> he says, what? <laughs> she says, it's our bridal night. You've got to do it or it will be special. You've got to shag me. He says, no way. <laughs> 23 pints of beer! <laughs> she says, you've got to do it, it's separate. It won't, I'll be shamed. My friends will know if we don't consume me. If we do con consume me. If, if you don't shag me! He <laughs> says, look, look, I can't. He just says, you've got to do it. It's, I can't. He says, look, you don't have to do anything fancy. Just stick it in for a minute. That's all. <laughs> so we can say we did. He says, stick what? <laughs> You don't love me. I knew you didn't love me. I mean, he's desperate. He's searching the hotel room, trying to find a pencil and a bit of sellotape to lash together a rudimentary splint, you know. He's, he's wondering whether there's a page dealing with this in his SAS survivor's guide. <laughs> She's not giving up. You've got to do it. I can't. It's my bread all night. You've got to do it. She, he says, she says, come on, I'll entice you. <laughs> You've got to, so he's going to have a go. He sidles over and starts snogging, you know, hoping something will get going. He's having a course, I love you, darling. Yeah, I knew you loved me, darling. You know, and slowly but surely, a little bit of romance begins to happen. He's, he's thinking, I might get away with it. There's a touch of firmness here. I think I might get away with it. Then, oh, no, disaster. One of them burps with a bit of sick in it. <laughs> away at his throat. Ah! She gets a whiff of it. Oh, you dirty bastard. I wish I'd never married you, you bastard. Go in the bathroom and eat some toothpaste. And come back here and shag me. Five hours later, he wakes up. Floor of the toilet. Tube of Colgate in his eye. But please, please, ladies and gentlemen, don't let me put you off. Because <laughs> it will be the most beautiful night of your life. That's a tradition that always works. There's so many things that always work. The bride will look beautiful. It's a rule of weddings. The bride looks beautiful, and she always does. There's never been a bride that didn't. Brides look beautiful. But don't say so. Whatever you do, don't say so. Not, not if you're the groom, don't say so, because you see, Compliments divide the sexes. Oh yes, compliments mean different things to different genders. Because you see, the universe is broad and it is wide. And on one side live the men. <laughs> and far, 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 far away, beyond another dimension in a different space and time, live the women. And there the twain shall meet, and across the space-time continuum, there are various dividing lines, and one of them is compliments. Because you see, on the whole, it's a generalisation, but probably true to say, most men, they'll take a compliment. They like it. 
They'll have some more. They'll drag it, screaming from unwilling witnesses. Any bit of sartorial approbation coming their way, they'll have a bit of that. He's come home from the January sales. He's wearing 40 quid's worth of top man tastiness. <laughs> he loves himself. What do you think, my darling? Saucy, tasty, tasty, saucy, saucy, tasty, tasty, saucy. What do you think, my darling? It's all right. <laughs> all right! Le Dergs Bullocks, I think he means. <laughs> Canine Love Blurbs, I think. Because he loves it, you know? Most men, they become relatively relaxed about themselves physically as the years go by. Look at that, that's coming on, that, innit? I'm really quite... <laughs> I'm really quite proud of that. That's I put a lot of work into that. Slap, slap, slap. Look, I can make it go... <laughs> she loves it, you know? She really does, warm and cuddly. She don't say, but I know she does. She loves it. <laughs> Women, on the whole, you see, are less, less happy with a compliment. In fact, they don't like them at all. They don't want to know. Rather do without. You look beautiful tonight, darling. Oh, fuck off! <laughs> I said you look beautiful. Look, you're just going to go on like that. I'm going to watch the bloody telly, all right? Because <laughs> you see, women are almost rather, to me, to, on average, seem to rather have, a, have, a, have an insult. You don't need to be there. You're out shopping, Miss Selfridge. Top girl, you're sat outside the changing room. She's inside, putting on a frock. The curtain twitches out, she comes, you've not got a chance, she's off. It doesn't work, does it? I knew it wouldn't work. I don't know why I put it on. I can't wear this sort of thing. No, don't, because I know it doesn't. I can't wear this sort of thing. Some girls can, but I can't. I knew it wouldn't work. I wish it would, but it doesn't, so I can't. She's back inside, you're sat there. <laughs> you might as well not be this, so you go home. She comes home three hours later. Well, I bought this. I don't know why. I won't wear it. <laughs> Now, there may be those amongst you thinking, <laughs> hang on a minute, Ben, this is getting a little bit sexual stereotype, and what's going on here, eh? A bit of Bernard Manning coming through. Well, what? <laughs> what's going to be next? My fucking wife. <laughs> there are differences, you know? I think it's been established demographically that women like to cuddle beyond the first year of the relationship. <laughs> now, men like to cuddle, too but only as a pre-shag preamble. <laughs> now, this leads... This leads to endless frustration <laughs> and confusion <laughs> sat on the sofa. Come on in. Give us a cuddle. Who <laughs> <laughs> for shag, then? I just want a cuddle. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Why? <laughs> I think what I'm, what I'm trying to say, and I, look, I know we've got a long way from the point, but uh, just, uh, we'll, we'll get back to the point in the second half, but just before we, we break, I just want to establish... The point is, I think I'm trying to say that in a relationship, you've got to look after the little things. That's what will niggle away at your love. People start thinking about living together. They're always thinking about the big stuff. Oh, sexual compatibility. Well, we'd be all right, you know. I better sleep with him or her. Check it out. But that's not the problem. But if you want to live with someone, sure, sleep with them. But don't check out the sex. That'll be fine. Check out the bathroom, right? <laughs> check out the state of your prospective living lover's toothpaste tube. Because let's face it, the shagging's going to wind down over the years, but you're always going to have to brush your teeth, aren't you? <laughs> so check out the toothpaste tube. Is it squeezed in the middle? Is the top nowhere to be seen? <laughs> Is the nozzle encrusted with dry, white grebby bits? With pubes stuck to it? <laughs> Could you live with that? If you can, fair enough, go for it. But that's what you're going to live with. They won't change. You have been warned. Alternatively, perhaps you're thinking of shacking up with the finicky type. You go in, their toothpaste tube is pristine. The top has been securely wound down. The tube has been wound up from the bottom <laughs> using the key off a sardine tin. <laughs> Could you live with that? If you can, then fair enough. But if you commit to someone like that, you've got to accept that for the rest of your life, you're going to get a bollocking every time you put a buttery knife in the Marmite. <laughs> sort out the little things, ladies. 
Are you thinking of committing your lives to the sort of swine, the sort of bloke, and this will almost always be a bloke, who is the sort of bastard who would use up the last of the toilet roll and fail to replace it? <laughs> or worse, leave one single sheet hanging over it? Plenty left, just enough for your fingers to go straight through. If you encounter a man like that, girls, then run, run out to mum. It doesn't matter how good a shaggy was, he will never change, and you will be destined to spend the rest of your lives doing the wet flap waddle. <laughs> Nick like that, and knickers round your ankles, you're going bastard, bastard. <laughs> some Kleenex. You can't find it. You've got to drip dry at the top of the stairs. The sort of bloke who would empty a bog roll and fail to replace it is normally the sort of swine, the sort of animal who can get through an entire bog roll in a single shit. <laughs> this man has got an ass on him like an industrial muck spreader. He can crack twice his body weight three times a day. His bowels are like Doctor Who's TARDIS. There is more room on the inside. He leaves that toilet stinking like Satan's sphincter on curry night in hell. I wouldn't go in there for a while if I were you, love. Right? How? How does he do it? She thinks, how does he do it? We eat the same things. <laughs> it comes out of her little scented, delicate rabbit pellets. He pebble dashes the top floor of the house. <laughs> What's he doing? Sneaking off secret and eating cow shit? <laughs> I think maybe it's probably best to leave you with that one. All right, you've got 15 minutes. Have a drink. See if you can get in a queue for the box, girls. I'll see you back here then for more stand-up comedy. Thank you. Change of T-shirt, thank you. Production values, you know, well, we are recording it. I thought I'd run to a second T-shirt, for God's sake. <laughs> Very nice, you see, to be making uh, a video in this absolutely gorgeous theatre. This is how they should make theatres, and good staff, too. I've got to pay this respect publicly. Very good people. Excellent light on the spot works, thank you very much. Excellent work on the spotlights was what I was trying to say. <laughs> and of course, 18 pints of Stradix old bow basher in the interval last night. <laughs> Excellent work on the spotlights, which isn't always the case. You might think that's Dirica, but it is not quite often. The spot operators, a couple of students on a freebie, very nice. <laughs> Physics students with no real sense of time, you know. <laughs> They've had a little drag on a doobie. It's like the Blitz some nights, you know. <laughs> Keep expecting to see a hind call diving through the beams. One night I was so angry in the interval, I said to one bloke, I said, listen, you silly git, you're constantly behind me. He said, no, man, time is a circle. You're ahead of me. <laughs> it's outrageous. You know, the funny thing is that often theatre staff aren't as nice as they are. I always have a problem backstage, or often, with... We're, we're, we're disappointing the backstage staff, the doorman and all that. It's always because I'm not so chirpy backstage. They say, oh dear, Mr. Old, you're a little bit dull, aren't you? Dear, oh dear. When Mr. Tarbuck used to come through, you <laughs> always have a regular laugh with the lads backstage. You know, it's a terrible thing, that occupational hazard of comedians. You're supposed to be being funny all the time. I mean, I'm not claiming special treatment. All jobs have occupational hazards. You know, like any doctors in the house will know that. They can't go to a party without being surrounded by people going, I've got this click in my elbow. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, being a comic, it just has to be a drag that people expect you to amuse them. Minicab drivers. I seem to have been put on earth to piss off and disappoint minicab drivers. <laughs> Every time I get in a minicab, I'm five seconds. This blimey, Ben, you're a bit boring, aren't you? Blimey, I, mean, <laughs> I thought having motor mouth in a cab would be an interesting and amusing experience. You're a bit dull, aren't you? You can't be the way you are at work when you're not at work. You're not going to act with your friends the way you do when you're at work. I mean, if minicab drivers did that, they wouldn't have any friends, would they? <laughs> if they bawled the bollocks off everyone down the pub the way they do their passengers, except being minicab drivers, they wouldn't be in the pub because they wouldn't know where it was. <laughs> so, my idea, we'll just drive around a bit longer, I'll keep the meter running. You can't 
take your work home with you. You'd go mad. I mean, imagine a cab driver at home. If he took his work home, I sat on the sofa, stretch covers, fag burns, kebab down the back of the cushion. <laughs> no good, would it? Nobody takes their work. I feel sorry for all these Tory cabinet ministers who are in danger of losing their jobs or having to resign pell-mell in a welter of sleaze as we speak. Because, you know, what are they going to do in the real world? I mean, will they carry on talking in that smug, shit, slime, superior, lying, bastard way they adopt in their current jobs? I mean, you wouldn't want to be... You wouldn't want to be stuck behind an ex-Tory cabinet minister while he tried to order a drink and a boozer, would you? You'd be there all night, a bastard. He'd be off. Of course I want a gin and tonic. I've always wanted a gin and tonic. <laughs> I've made it quite clear from the start that I want a gin and tonic and I have never deviated from my policy of wanting a gin and tonic. No, 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 no. You've asked me the question and you'll do me the courtesy of listening to the fullness of my answer. <laughs> no doubt the Labour Party will want a gin and tonic at some point. Ha, 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 Of course I want ice and lemon. I've always wanted ice and lemon. I've never deviated from my policy of wanting ice and no doubt the Labour Party will want ice and lemon. <laughs> of course I want a bag of crisps. I've always wanted a bag of crisps. I've never did. No doubt the Labour Party will want a bag of... Excuse, hey, sorry, don't go waiting for a punchline or anything, because there isn't one. Um, it's just a little bit of uh, hate that I have to get out of myself. Because these people are beyond satire. They're self-satirising. There's nothing you can say to take the piss. They're beneath contempt. I mean, the funny thing is, they keep saying John Major's their secret weapon. He's the best of them. And they're right! <laughs> what does that say? <laughs> Poor bastards, honestly. <laughs> and yet we sort of continue to respect them because of the job they hold. And I think this is the point I'm making style over content. You know, like, um, if it's a profession, we respect it. Now, I can see that with some jobs, you know, doctor, nurse, teacher professions worthy of respect, but some of the weirdest things, we respect them just because of the job they do. People who work in off-licences. <laughs> Funny that, how we give so much of our personality. We respect people who work in off-licences like they were some kind of guru, some kind of oracle. <laughs> I'll explain. I'm in Victoria Wine, right? Now, here I am, relatively well-adjusted. I feel fairly relaxed about myself. I'm in my 30s, I've been educated, I've got a degree. And yet, I go to Victoria Wine, I am an empty vessel. I have no personality, no opinions. I'm stood there with a bottle in my hand, a saying that a person behind the till, will I like this? <laughs> what does he know? I've never met the bastard before in my life. He's no idea about my taste, but he's very common. He says, oh yes, you'll like that. Good lemony aftertaste, good with fish. The but he's a student on holiday job, for Christ's sake. <laughs> he drinks cider and black at the weekend. <laughs> but I'm listening to him. Oh, I'll have that then. He says, well, perhaps you'd like a dessert wine. That one's good with pudding. Oh, this one's good with game. Bold, fruity, mellow. Big wine, good with game. Game? <laughs> game? He makes 40 quid a week. His idea of game is Kentucky Fried Chicken. <laughs> and yet I'm listening to the swine. What's going on? The problem is I'm not prepared to admit my ignorance. And this is what I'm talking about. We actually connive in our style destruction because we will not be honest about how uncool we are. Instead, we surf the bullshit tidal wave trying to look that little bit more sophisticated, that little bit cooler than we actually are. Wine is a classic example. You're in a restaurant, you sat there with your partner, your husband, your missus, whatever. The waiter comes over. Would you like to taste the wine, sir? You say, yes. Yes, thank you very much. That would be lovely. I'll taste the wine. Thank you. I'll taste the wine. Now, he knows. You know. Your partner knows. Everybody in the restaurant knows. Now, you're going to take a little sip. You're going to pause for a moment's careful thought. And then you're going to say, oh, Yes, that's very nice. <laughs> you can call. There is no chance in this world or the next of you saying, mm, a little bit peppery on the back of the palate, fuck off. <laughs> is we're always trying to look cooler than we are. Let's stop. Let's celebrate what we are. For heaven's sake, we'll never be cool. 
The goalposts move every week. We're always behind. We can't catch up every week. You buy your pretentious bollock section of your Sunday shite, and they've moved the goalposts. Ha ha, you thought that was cool, but we've moved on, so fuck off, you're out of fashion again. <laughs> I mean, last, what was it last year? Out of the blue, heroin became fashionable. It was amazing. So after train spotting, the junky lifestyle became a kind of designer thing. All the supermodels, you had junky sheep. They talked about it in the media. The junky sheep, supermodels painting dark circles under their eyes, living in rags, you know. The train spotting, I mean, it was ever so seductive, that film. It was a good film, but think about it, because what actually was being described was the most desperate and degraded lives. Renton, the lead cat in train spotting, he gets his drugs. He's that desperate to get them into his rattled, desperate system. He shoves them up his ass. He does. It's a nice night out. He's shoving his drums up his ass. It's a new one on me. I didn't know that that was a, a method of entry. I thought, well, I wonder if that'd work on a pint of lager. <laughs> It'd be a neat trick if you could learn it, wouldn't it? <laughs> no, think about it. It's one minute of closing time. You've got two pints lined up on the bar. <laughs> you don't want to waste it. The landlord's trying to rush you. All right, here we go. One in the front, one up the arse. Here we go. <laughs> How was it that those desperate people were rendered looking so kind of attractive, cool, sophisticated, style? In this case, it was the accent. That was the predominant thing. That whole Edinburgh thing, you know? That whole cool sort of Scottish thing. It sounded so sort of dead hard, didn't it? Dead dry, dead sophisticated, you know? Hello, my name's Renton. I do smark. I use scarg. I'm a foolish cunt. <laughs> It just sounded cool with that accent. I mean, imagine if they'd said it in southern England with a git like me. Hello, my name's Renton. <laughs> <laughs> me and my friend Sick Boy were shoving our drugs up our arseholes when, when I pulled mine out and had to search my diarrhea for it. <laughs> it really was a marvellous evening. You should have been there. <laughs> Wouldn't work, would it? You gotta have the right pools, cos that whole Scottish thing, you know, they're dead hard, the cynical people are strong. Strong people in Scotland, hard, tough people. Strong, hard, tough. <laughs> well, if you live in a country where the thistles are waist high and they've only recently invented trousers, you're gonna <laughs> tell them! <laughs> Maybe the train spotting treatment could make me look good, you know? Bit of Irving Walsh. Hello. My name's Ben. <laughs> I do lager. <laughs> I use her. <laughs> the problem is some things are beyond sophistication and drinking beer is one of them. But the weirdest thing is happening, ladies and gentlemen. Beer drinking is being redesigned. It's becoming a sophisticated occupation. All the beers are becoming designer beers. Since your new lad became a fashion icon, since acting like a pissed up aggressive wanker became a style statement, beer, his tipple of choice, has become stylish too. So out of the blue go the old beers and we got new ones now. Instead of Carlsberg, we got Carlsberg Ice. <laughs> Cold filtered Heineken. Dry filtered Fosters. We're all going, oh, that Carlsberg Ice, that's a bit of all right. It's the same piss poor bollocks we've been drinking all the time. <laughs> Put a silly new name on it. We fall for it every time. It's part of the bullshit tidal wave. They could have made up any name, never mind cold filtered. What about jet filtered? <laughs> Turbo brewed, brewed in turbos, filtered through jets. I mean, it's just, it's just wang marketing. They've decided they want to relocate beer in the class structure. So out of the blue Guinness, they came up with a lager last year. Guinness, what did they call it? Enigma. Because we're all sophisticated. Now, now, 15 years ago, if Guinness had made up a lager, they would have called it shotgun. <laughs> or gunpowder or something. But now it's enigma. Oh, yeah, well, of course, because your average night in a pub sums it up. Don't it? A pint of enigma, please, mate. <laughs> Two halves of conundrum for the ladies. <laughs> Small paradox, no ice. <laughs> <laughs>
We are victims of this, for heaven's sake. I mean, honestly, you cannot make booze cool. I, I remember the days when, when beer was advertised honestly, you know? Hofmeister, it was the lads, wasn't it? You knew where you were. I mean, the bear was a bit confusing, but, you know... <laughs> Basically, you knew where you were these days. All the ads for beer are surreal. You know, like you've got Jack D wandering through that surreal landscape with penguins buzzing round his head while he makes dry little comments. And then there's all the Irishmen with the faces of gentle poets. That's who drinks the beer in Ireland. They're all upside down in a fish tank saying, I'm not bitter. <laughs> what is it about? They're just trying to render our sad little love, which is beer sophisticated. What's coming next? What other little pleasure are they going to try and make feel cool? A pot noodle? How about that? <laughs> they could make that sophisticated next, couldn't they? They could get the Irishman with the face of the poet. He could do the pot noodle ads, couldn't he? Ah, here's how my daddy told me to make the pot noodle. <laughs> now, first you have to pour the hot water into the pot. And then you must wait. You must wait now while the scum of MSG and reconstituted vegetables <laughs> rises to the surface. Now, you can't rush a pot noodle, sure you can. <laughs> you have to wait. You have to wait while the little bits of gristle swell up <laughs> in the hot water. But when it's finished, ah, it is like sucking out the inside of a hoover bag. <laughs> what's happening. It's comedians' fault. What's happened is, comedians have been taking a piss out of adverts for so long, the advertisers have got, they got cheesed off. They, they've decided to make unskittable adverts. Adverts out of which the piss has already been taken. <laughs> I can think of no other logical explanation to explain the phenomenon of the Ferrero Rocher ad. <laughs> That or drugs, let's face it. Or maybe, I don't know, maybe it was de rigueur in uh, diplomatic circles to have a couple of Ferrero Rochers at a party with the tiaras on. Maybe James Bond always had two or three in the top pocket of his dinner jacket. <laughs> don't dance the close, you're crushing my chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> But it's another example of trying to render our little pleasures sophisticated. Everyone likes a chocolate, but now they're saying, oh, it's sophisticated. Post people do it too. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, the ambassador has Ferrero Rocher. Sophisticated bollocks. <laughs> so they're just going to get a foreign name to make them sophisticated. You can buy them in every news agent in the country. <laughs> There's trays of them underneath the wank mags. They cost less than a Cadbury's cream egg. I mean, if the ambassador had really wanted to spoil his guests, he would have nodded in a tray full of cream eggs, wouldn't he? <laughs> oh, monsieur, with the king-sized Mars bars and the curly whirlies, you are really spoiling <laughs> Although, in all fairness, I do have a sneaking kind of admiration for the Ferrero Rocher ethic. Because you know what I mean? Like, you know, at a party, like, if someone nodded in the Ferrero Rochers, you'd be quite pleased, really, wouldn't you? Because most party food is crap, you know? <laughs> Bits of greasy pizza and Marks and Spencer's crudité. <laughs> Marks and Spencer's, they've ruined party food. All these fucking crudité, it's raw vegetables with a mayonnaise dip. I don't want it. Bring back a cocktail sausage and a lump of cheese and a pineapple chunk. That's what we like. <laughs> But no, it's all Marks and Sparks now. You get your party food from Marks and... Oh, isn't it marvellous? Where's Marks and Sparks? It's silly to make your own. I mean, people go to parties, they're wearing Marks and Sparks clothes, they're eating Marks and Sparks. You might as well have the fucking party at Marks and Sparks. <laughs> Just all them, oh, you and your mates go down there, bollock naked, pop on a frock and a pair of knickers and start stealing chicken off the shelf. <laughs> be every party in Britain, wouldn't it? Marks and Spencers. They're re-educating us. We've all got to eat the crap they keep thinking up. Crudite. It's raw vegetables. But don't talk to me about the mayonnaise dip. Some bastard had all of that on a bit of French bread hours ago. <laughs> I'm left munching on raw cauliflower florets. <laughs> this is a party, right? Normally I wouldn't feed it to a donkey, but no. <laughs> Marvellous party. <laughs> Marks and Spencer's are teaching us all these words we never heard of. Crudité. Canapé. Oh, Marks and Spencer's canapés. Oh, aren't they marvellous? Well, they look so good. Well, you're silly to make your own, aren't you? Oh, how marvellous. We're having canapés on the law. Canapés probably like dry filter. They probably made the name up. I mean, five years ago, we'd never heard of it, had we? You would have thought a canapé was a can of peas with only one pea left in it. <laughs> Suddenly we're all going, can 
Pepe, who had another can of paint, style over content. They look all right, taste bleeding horrible. <laughs> you ever read the box? A delicate pastry shell filled with the phlegm of a Tuscan mountain goat. <laughs> Topped with a sun-dried hamster's bollock. <laughs> Marks and Spencers have got out of hand, that's all I'm saying. They have got out of hand. I mean, you know, they're doing too much for us now. They're rendering us without a role in our lives. You know, everything's cooked, prepared. There's a little fork. Look, mate, I can put my own fucking jam in my scone, you know? <laughs> Leave me something to do. I want to be included. I, I need to be there, you know? I mean, I'm not saying it's not nice. Don't get me wrong. Marks and Spencer's food on, it's like pornography. It's like an, it's like an orgasm. You, you go down there, you just, you just want to eat everything. You, it's all so lovely, beautiful. It's all been packaged so nice and lovely. You want to eat it all. It's all shiny and lovely. You want it all. You want to eat the tills, the staff, the floor. You want to eat it. Everything's been done for you all. They save you so much time, aren't they clever? Oh, look, an entire meal of chicken tikka masala with fluffy rice and crispy pompadons. Aren't they clever? They save you so much time. Oh, look, a, a chili dip with a a full range of different savoury garlic breadsticks. Aren't they clever? They save you so much time. Aren't they clever? Oh, look! Grated cheese! Aren't they clever? <laughs> Marks and Spencer's grated cheese. How clever of them to grate the cheese. They save you so much time. Oh, oh! Mashed potatoes. They've mashed the potatoes. How clever of them. They save you so much time. They put a knob of butter in it. Save you so much time. Put the pepper in it. Saves you time. Oh, look! Peeled mandarins. They've peeled your mandarins for you. Saves you so much time. they peeled the mandarins. How much time can you save for Christ's sake? You're staying here long enough, you start getting younger. <laughs> I'm stood in the house, my bollocks are retreating back up my body. I walk out, I see myself coming in ten years ago. <laughs> Who's that kid in a sparkly suit? <laughs> have done everything for you. Everything, nothing that you could do that they haven't done. What are they thinking of every day? They must think, what can we do next? What we, we've done the scones, we've done the, we've done the little cream cake. Uh, toast and marmalade, that's what we'll do. <laughs> the Marks and Spencer's toast and marmalade range. Two slices of prime bread, <laughs> gently flame grilled, buttered and topped with a generous serve of Seville marmalade. <laughs> We'd all be going, oh, that's good, that'll save us time, won't it? Toast and marmalade, aren't they clever? Five quid, I'll have some of that, lovely. <laughs> Every day, Marks and Spencer's design team trying to work out something they haven't done for us. Here's one! The Marks and Spencer's pre-dunked digestive. <laughs> for those of you too busy to suck out the middle of your own walnut whips, <laughs> Marks and Spencer's offer a sachet of finest fondant cream mixed with spit. <laughs> more they can do for us. It must be so frustrating. They've done it all. They've packaged it. They've seasoned it. They've given us a little fork. They're just going to have to eat it for us. That's the only thing. The Marks and Spencer's pre-digested range. <laughs> a turd in a plastic tray. <laughs> Put in microwave, heat to body temperature, flush down toilet. <laughs> It'd save time, wouldn't it? Here's a thought. They could do a curry range, couldn't they? With a little tube of deep heat to smear on your arsehole. <laughs> that we're living in a society where style means more than content. Marketing means more than the actual product, the American marketing ethic, right? Because, you know, marketing means something in America. To them, it's a, it's a way of life, but we've never really had a history of it. Traditionally, in Britain, right, when we have something that we all like, we keep it the same. If there's a product that everyone likes, they keep it exactly the same. They never change it at all. Uh, Marmite, uh, Heinz ketchup, Ah, uh, Noel's house party. <laughs> Doesn't change at all. From week to week, exactly the same. <laughs> Actually, I feel terrible doing that, you know what I mean? Because any time, you know, little slip in a career and it could be me. Knock, knock, hello, Noel. Yes, I need the money. You know what I mean? <laughs> You've got to watch it, take the piss out of that. Noel's our a showbiz unemployment agency, isn't it? And all power to him. It's good that he keeps the work up. Anyway, what I'm saying is we traditionally do not have a marketing policy, you know. But in America, they love it. It's part of their, their culture. It is a modern art to them. In America, if you've got a product that everyone likes, then they remarket it. Strange, like McDonald's, the most successful restaurant in history. In, in America, they couldn't sell anymore if they tried. But nonetheless, 
They've remarketed it. And in America now, they have Express McDonald's. McDonald's is Express. That's the point. It's supposed to be Express. McDonald's means fast. So Express McDonald's is a tautology. Express fast, very fast, fast, fast food. <laughs> Express fast, fast than last week. That was fast, this is bleeding fast. How fast <laughs> do you want it? You go in there, Big Mac, please. For fuck's sake! <laughs> Jesus, the thing's embedded in the back wall. There's chips whistling past your ears. <laughs> now, look, I, I must at this point point out that I do accept that we could do with Express McDonald's over here. <laughs> Because we've never really got it, have we? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? The poor old Americans have tried to make us like them, do things their way, but you see, you can put the hat on the British teenager, but you've still got a British teenager <laughs> under the hat. <laughs> And that's the problem, you see. The poor old Americans, they came over here 20 years ago, they tried to make us do it their way, they closed all the wimpies, the golden eggs, they opened the McDonald's, they got all the staff in. OK, now you know how you have to do it now. You have to smile the whole time. You have to wear the uniform. You have to be clean. The food must be ready at all times. What do you say to the customer? Have a nice day. <laughs> You say, have a nice day, well done, okay. Does everybody understand the McDonald's ethic? Well, yeah, we get it. The Americans went, huh? Everybody lit up a fag? <laughs> it's been that way ever since, because, like, in America, service means something to kids in McDonald's. They're happy. Marketing service is part of their culture. They might own the place one day. You go in there, it's enthusiasm. Veggie burger, please. Certainly, sir. Here is your meal. Have a nice day. May I suck your dick? <laughs> Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not suggesting... This is, I'm not blaming the Americans. They just happen to have the most powerful economy and culture at which... the point at which are kind of the world's affairs became truly global. I mean, we don't have it. This concept of national ideas and finance and currency, it's all bollocks. I mean, the world is run by international, global companies, multinationals. They sell the same products all over the world, and hence the marketing strategy must be the same worldwide to facilitate easy profits. And, of course, they go with the American model. So everywhere you go in the world, you see adverts which could be made in America. It's, it's absurd. I mean, I've never seen a bursting fire hydrant on a New York street. I've never seen a gorgeous New York babe rollerblading through Central Park. But apparently, these things sum up the spirit of the British tampon. <laughs> Body form, press on towel. I love that phrase. It always reminds me of something Joyce Grenfell would have said in a kind of 1950s radio sketch. Come on, you towels, press on. <laughs> press on, towels. Because to me, it's an intriguing phrase, press on, towels. Because I was, I was, genuinely, I was confused about it. I mean, I, yeah, I'll, I'll tell you this. I don't, I, I don't always tell people this, but we're bonding, aren't we? I think there's a, <laughs> there's a sort of warmth developing here, so... The point is, <laughs> I used to think that press on towels, right? <laughs> I mean, I didn't think about them all the time, obviously. <laughs> they weren't constantly on my mind. I did, look, look, let's put it this way. If I had thought about press on towels... <laughs> this isn't easy for me, you know? I'm trying to work this through, OK? If I think I thought... You were supposed to press them on your fanny. <laughs> I did. Most of the blokes in the room going, yeah. <laughs> what are you laughing at, love? I did. I thought it was some kind of suction arrangement. <laughs> I thought it like was one of them things you put on your fridge door, you know. <laughs> You schlock it on, you get a decent all-round seal, girls, and you're ready to live your life as you choose. You know? <laughs> Go hang gliding and rollerblading. A friend of mine, she said, no, you silly bugger, for Christ's sake, suction. You fool, they're adhesive, they're sticky. I said sticky? <laughs> Jesus, that's a high price to pay for menstrual cleanliness, isn't it? Makes me eyes water to think about it. 
she said, no, you silly burke, you don't stick them on your fanny, you fool, you, you stick them to your knickers, you put them in the gusset, that's where you stick it, stop it moving around. I said, oh. <laughs> Mind you, she did concede, she did accept that if you're a bit pissed, girls, when you put it in, and you get it a little bit skew with, you might catch a couple of long ones and all day it's... <laughs> Sorry, I've gone too far now, I know. I, I could just feel the sympathy suddenly disappear. <laughs> Let's move on. Anyway, <laughs> what were we talking about? This is the point. Marketing. Our lives are ruined. I can't even watch the ITN news anymore because I might watch the weather. And if I watch the weather, I'll have to sit through that fatuous little bit where they say power gen, bringing you electricity, whatever the weather. <laughs> well, thanks a fucking lot. <laughs> Pay for it, you know, you fatuous <laughs> bastard. You're not giving it this for nothing. We're supposed to be pleased that even though it's raining, we can still turn the lights on. <laughs> we haven't worked that out 85 fucking years ago, you know. I mean, the grocer doesn't say, green grocer, giving you your half pound of bananas, even though there's a nip in the air, does he? <laughs> That's all we got from privatisation, more marketing, not more quality. Don't talk about quality, whatever. Is it better? No. Water? Did the stuff used to back away up the pipe before privatisation? <laughs> I don't need the gas. Did donkey farts used to emanate from the jets when you turned it on? No. All we got was more marketing. Buses. They sold the buses off. Have we got more buses? No, we got less buses, but more names for buses. Because I'm going around the country at the moment and I'm collecting a name in every town, sometimes two or three. Because you don't get on a bus anymore. You get on a city hopper. <laughs> Someone was paid to come up with that. A stop and shopper. A town around. A busy bee. A scuttle shuttle. A wank tank. <laughs> I made the last one up. <laughs> If it's best, I might send it in. You, they sold the trains. Have we got more trains? No, we've got less trains, less services, but more names for trains. Because you don't get on the inner city anymore, do you? You get on the West Coast Pullman, the Midland Flyer, the East Coast Express. Thank you all for using the East Coast Express. We never forget, you have a choice. Yeah! You can pay twice as much for half the service, or you can fuck off. <laughs> That's all that's left. Marketing. We live, we live in, a, in a free and classless society. John Major's first bit of marketing was classless society. Now, we used to have third class on trains, didn't we? We don't have that anymore. That wouldn't work in John Major's meritocracy. The new Labour voting son would not like to see British boys travelling third class. That's for foreign muck, innit? Our boys would not travel third class. But actually, our boys and our girls do travel third class all the time. And fourth class and fifth class. Cunningly disguised by marketing as... Super savers. <laughs> a super duper savy savers. <laughs> Passengers in possession of a super duper savy saver may use the front portion of any train on the second Tuesday in Lent in a leap year. <laughs> now, I can sell you a super duper savy savy saver saver. Uh, you can't actually get on a train, but you are entitled to run along the side of the train. <laughs> and all that's left is more lies because as the public transport dies, we're all forced to the one thing we all dreamt of, the freedom of the private motor car. I quote Mrs Thatch, she wants the great car economy. In the middle ages, she said, every Briton has a right to the freedom of the private motor car. And we'd love it, wouldn't we? Because we got the bleeding cars, the freedom's a bit of a long time coming because everywhere we are in chains. We live in one long traffic jam and yet every single car ad bullshits an image of driving glory. Where are they making these ads? Venus, for Christ's sake. Car adverts. They make the Ferrero Rocher ad look like socialist realism. <laughs> you watch the car ads, they're 
Peugeot, the Renault, the Ford, whatever, doesn't matter what the car, they're always driven by smug, happy people. He's a good look, he's like James Bond, he's so smug driving along. I'm not surprised he's smug because there is only ever one car in car ad world. There is no one else on the road. This man has his own road. There's no cars in front, there's no cars behind, there's none from side to side. I say, don't tell me it's a Ford, I don't give a fuck. I want to know where the road is. <laughs> tell me where that road is, I'll drive on it in anything, a wheelbarrow, a space hopper. Just let me go along an empty road once before I die. You saw the Peugeot ad with all the individual thoughts. You know, he's driving along and he's, he's thinking, because there are no average drivers. We are all individuals. He's driving along being such an individual. Peugeot assure us we all think a million original thoughts every day because there are no average drivers. What's Peugeot man thinking about? He's thinking about saving a little girl from an oncoming juggernaut. <laughs> he's thinking about standing up to fascist tanks in, in Eastern Europe because there are no average drivers. Bollocks. <laughs> we're all average drivers. And when we get in a car, we're all thinking the same thing. We're not thinking about saving little girls or standing up to fascist tanks. We're thinking we want to kill the bastard in front <laughs> and we want to kill the bastard behind. <laughs> Everyone in the country sat in our cars at the same time thinking exactly the same thing. 30 million of us thinking, I have just crawled past 10 miles of bollards and cones and contraflow and I have yet to encounter the man digging as promised in the little tin triangle. <laughs> just once, just once could one car ad have an experience that related to our experience with cars? Could Nicole run out as a French chateau? She'd say, ba 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 ba, runs over to the sexy little Cleo, a oh, bollocks, some wanker nick my radio again. <laughs> Because we know that cars do not make us happy. They do not make us calm. We love them. We've all got them. But we know they're destroying the world and they're destroying us. Because we get in our cars and we ain't human anymore. Because we allow ourselves to act in a manner that we would never, ever, ever act under any other circumstances. Imagine it. If you were walking up the high street, you were walking along the pavement, and there was someone in front of you walking a little bit slower than you, would you feel justified in screaming, you dozy fucking wanky arsehole? Can you fucking believe this brat, this dickhead, this wanker, this tosspot? Die, you bastard, fuck off and die! Learn to walk, why don't you? Would you feel you could do that? If there was a little old lady walking in front, slowly, with a walking stick, would you feel justified in getting a quarter of an inch behind her and walking, saying, you have got to fucking move, bitch. You think you can walk slower than me? Well, I'm going to intimidate you. I'm going to force you. I'll force you along this fucking road, bitch. And if you don't like it, get off the fucking pavement. <laughs> walking past Boots and a young mum came out laden with shopping and three kids to look after, would you be going, I'm here, I'm here, did you fucking see me? I'm here! <laughs> lads, lads, do you carry a torch round in your back pocket so you can whip it out when you don't like people and flash it in their eyes? <laughs> <laughs> we got to get hold of ourselves, ladies and gentlemen. The world's changing and we don't notice. We're all glued to the screen, watching the bullshit tidal wave sweep over us. Let's stand like Canute on the shores of the culture, say, thus far and no further. No more of your style bullshit. I refuse to try and be cool. You can see there'd be no point with me anyway. Ladies and gentlemen, what a pleasure to play this beautiful hall. You really have been a marvellous audience. I'd like to say you've been fantastic. It's been a pleasure to play here and I look forward to returning. My name's Ben Elton. Good night. Yeah.